Folks, this morning we're reading from John's Gospel, uh, turning back to our study in John. We've been studying through the Gospel of John for some time now, a uh, journey through John, and John's expressed motivation within his Gospel is that we might believe, and that by believing in Jesus we may have life and life eternal. That is the great promise of the Gospel. We come to a challenging passage today, uh, but it, all Scripture is God-breathed, and it is profitable and helpful for training in righteousness, as Paul reminds us as he writes to uh, Timothy. Uh, so, we come to a section uh, today called, entitled, The Children of the Devil, uh, which is not something perhaps that any of us want to spend an awful lot of time dwelling upon, and yet it is absolutely necessary for us to understand uh, both the human condition and the great wonder of the gospel. So, we're going to read from verses 31 uh, down to verse 47 of John's gospel and the words that are on the screen for you. This is God's Word. To the Jews who had believed Him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered Him, we are Abraham's descendants, and we have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me, because you have no room for my word. I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. And you are doing what you have heard, and and you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, said Jesus, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We're not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet, because I tell you, because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Amen. May the Lord bless that reading. Let's again pray. God our Father, we pray this morning that you might give us receptive hearts and minds as we consider your word and as we look at a portion of Scripture that is arresting and that is convicting and that is challenging. Lord, so often we fall into the trap of resting upon our own religious convictions. So often we fall into the trap of relying upon what we might do, that we seem to uh, delude ourselves with the subconscious thought that by doing more, that by upholding more tradition, and that by continuing in ceremonial religious rite, that we make ourselves acceptable before you. And yet the gospel tells us that we are more wretched than we would ever dare hope, that we are uh, children of the devil if we are outside Christ, that we follow the spirit of the power of the air that is now at work in those who are disobedient, Paul reminds us. 
Lord, there was a time when we can all say that we were in that state, but God, but God in His infinite kindness, in His steadfast loving kindness to us, has sent Jesus in order that we may be redeemed, that we might defect from the side of the evil one, and that we may come to know eternal hope and life in and through Christ, secure for us, kept by God Himself, though we may be tested with fiery trial that comes to refine our faith. Lord God, we pray this morning that You would speak into the hearts and lives of those who have not yet come under the Lordship of Jesus. We pray for those who are still under the Lordship of Satan, those who still follow the ethos of this world, those who think that the trappings of this world will be enough, that these things will bring the satisfaction and the meaning and the fulfillment that they so yearn. Lord, we know that that cannot be found in anything that might be bought, earned, or amassed in the world in which we live, but that that is found truly and definitively in and through Jesus the Savior. And so, Lord, we pray that You would give us open hearts, that You would give us receptive minds, that You give us soft hearts today to accept Your Word, to receive the challenge that it sets forth for us, and perhaps to set us on a new course, on a new path. Lord, would You send Your Spirit and power upon us? So many here have sat under the sound of the gospel for many years, and yet are seemingly unmoved by it. Lord, we pray that You would move hearts, that You would change lives, and that You would have all of the glory, for we pray, it, pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, turn back with me to John's Gospel. And today, we are really looking at verses uh, 42 down to 47, with God's help. There is a popular notion that has been around for a long time, and it's called universalism. I'm sure some of you have heard or come across the theme of universalism at some point. The idea of universalism is that no matter who you are, no matter how you live, no matter what you do in your life, you'll go to heaven. That really all of what comes to pass in life doesn't really matter because ultimately God is good and He's benign and He's loving and uh, He's kind. Universalism proposes that because God is the Father of all humanity, then we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, that we are all children of God. And whilst it's a nice thought, and whilst it gives us a bit of security, it's false. It's not true. Uh, I've met people in the village here who have said to me, I'm a universalist. And I always ask, well, based upon what? Because it's not based upon the Word of God. It's not based upon the Bible. Because if you read the Bible, if you consider Jesus and His words, there is no way that you can come to the conclusion that everybody will go to heaven. It's just simply not true. And yet many people believe that because we want to believe that. So it's not just us that contend with that problem yet today in 21st century Scotland, and it is a problem. We hear it even, like I say, within our own village. But Jesus Himself dealt with this problem as well. People with foolish and erroneous wrong ideas about spiritual things. You see, the truth is that God is not the Father of all, that we are not all the children of God. We are all created by God. We are the creation of God. We are created in His image and in His likeness. We've spoken about that at length before. I don't need to cover old ground. And we know that to be the truth because Jesus Himself said, on that day many will come to Me and say, Lord, Lord, and I will say, away from Me, for I never knew you. It's a stark and it's a solemn truth, but it's a truth nonetheless. So that's really what we're exploring here today in this passage that is difficult and that is prickly and that is challenging. It is the fatherhood of God that is on display. Whose child are we truly, spiritually speaking? Because here's Jesus interacting with a group of people who believed that God was their father, that they were okay spiritually, and yet what He tells them is that they have the devil's DNA. 
that they had murderous thoughts in their hearts, that they rejected and detested the truth that Jesus was coming with. Oh, they were religious. Oh, they were religious. They were religious down to the letter. They were fastidious in their keeping, in their observation of all things religious, but they rejected Jesus. They wanted to kill him. They wanted rid of him because he was challenging their religion. And I guess the question this morning is, do we need our religion challenged? What we believe. Jesus gives them a paternity test, ultimately, to determine who their spiritual father really is. Paternity tests have become more common in recent years through, I suppose, Jerry Springer and the, the shows that all flowed from that. But also just the culture that we live in, the easy culture, as it were, people sleeping around more and more. It is noticed that there are in excess of 30,000 paternity tests performed in the UK every year. The number in the United States is over 250,000. According to one source at the University of Liverpool, one in 25 fathers are unknowingly raising a child that is not their own. That's depressing, is it not? It's quite scary. Well, they can take a paternity test to determine who their child is, and indeed a child can take a paternity test to find out who their true father is. Well, how do we know what our spiritual DNA is? Is there a test that we can take to determine who our spiritual father is? Yes, there is. There is. However, even without a paternity test, there are ways and means by which we can determine who belongs to who, isn't there? You don't have to look far, even within our own congregation here. You can tell the child of a parent. You can tell by similarities within them. You can look at some children that are like carbon copies of their parent, not just in looks, not just in features, but perhaps the way they talk, perhaps the words they use, perhaps even the way that they walk. It is unmistakable. But there is also the reality that sometimes a paternity test is required. And so it is spiritually. There are traits within the children of God, spiritually speaking, which should be manifestly evident. If we claim Jesus as Lord, people should be able to determine that simply by looking at us, simply by watching us, simply by listening to us, simply by observing how we respond and how we react and how we engage in life. But there is a paternity test that we can take. So I want to look at three Ps uh, this morning, the premise, the pretenders, and the paternity test. So the premise, first of all. The words of Jesus here uh, indicate to us that he's working off a premise, that there is a baseline, that there is, a, there is an assumption that he is working off. And that premise, that baseline, that assumption is that the devil is real, that Satan is real. Jesus refers to him as being real. Just as he speaks of Abraham as a historical, real historical figure, so he's referring to the devil, to Satan as a real historical figure. And not only as a real historical figure, but as somebody who was personal. He uses personal pronouns to describe him. He refers to Satan not as it, but as him. It's a personal pronoun that he engages. Not only was he historical, not only was he personal, but he's also a fallen being, isn't he? He'd fallen from somewhere. He'd sunk to a lower level. He was a murderer from the beginning, he says in verse 44, not holding to the truth. The King James Version says he abode not in the truth. It's quite picturesque. He once had a standing from which he fell. He's not in that standing any longer. There is no truth in him. He's a murderer. He is a liar. Now, I say all of that because many people would promote that the idea of a real, historical, personal, fallen being by the name of Satan would be utter uh, nonsense, ludicrous, just mythological nonsense, something that people have conjured up that they have created and made uh, to deal with their guilty conscience for doing certain things. That's what probably the majority of uh, the world 
would think. And so they present the devil as somebody like we see in the cartoons, you know, the wee red figure with the, the goatee and the horns and the, and the pitchfork. And they say, what a load of nonsense. I'm not going to believe that. They think, well, you know, the devil is just a metaphor. It's a metaphor for evil. It's a symbol for evil. He's not real. He's not a real person. Like the two little six-year-old boys who were having a conversation, and one of them says, I don't believe in the devil. And the friend says, you don't believe in the devil? He's written about all over the Bible. And his friend says, yeah, I know, but he's sort of just like Santa Claus, isn't he? Devil just turns out to be your dad. Sometimes we might be like the devil, and there's perhaps more truth in that. Spiritually speaking, he can be our spiritual father. But here's the premise that Jesus is working off here. The devil is real, historical, personal. He is a fallen being who has fallen from his original position and now is a malevolent being who is wreaking havoc in the world. He is the God of this world, small g. There's another part of the premise here, though, that perhaps we don't often like to think about, is that everybody has a relationship with the devil. What do I mean? I mean that he is either your spiritual father, or God is your spiritual father. And if God is your spiritual father, then the devil is your spiritual opponent. He is your nemesis. He is your enemy. But we all have a relationship with him. We're either part of his team, we're either following him unknowingly or subconsciously, or we have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has liberated us from sin and death, the one who has given us a hope eternal, that we have defected from the lordship of Satan, and we have come under the lordship of Christ. We have jumped ship. The devil is now our enemy. Now, the majority of people would say, how dare you infer or assume that I am under the lordship of Satan? I certainly am not. Nobody controls me. I make my own choices. I am the master of my own ship. I am the captain of my own fate. I am the master of my own destiny. Oh, we'd love to think so. But Paul reminds us in Ephesians 2 that outside Christ we are dead in our trespasses and sins. We are dead as we follow the prince of the power of the air, the one who is now at work in those who are disobedient. We are condemned as objects of God's wrath because we're spiritually dead. We were created in the image and the likeness of God for spiritual life, but we have rejected Him, and we have turned to our own way and done our own thing, and therefore we have believed the lie of Satan that you can make it. You're good. Ultimately, inherently, you're just a good person. You're not a bad person. You're a good person. Don't let anybody tell you that you're bad. Don't let anyone say to you that you, you can't measure up then Jesus comes along and says, look, here's the perfect law of God, and you have to uphold that perfectly without blemish, without defect, without faltering, without mistake, without error. And we say, not possible. We say, exactly, because you're a sinful person. There is sin in your heart. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the premise that Jesus works off here is that the devil is real, that he is historical, personal, fallen, and that he has a relationship with everybody. It's amazing how Jesus often breaks things down, we've said it before, to the irreducible minimum. You're either born again or you're not. You're either in the light or you're in the darkness. You're either saved or you're lost. You're either for me or you're against me. You're either sons of God or sons of the devil. He does that a lot. He, he takes it to his irreducible minimum. He makes it simple for us. Now, if we're a Christian, if you're a Christian believer, if you're a disciple of Christ this morning, then the devil is your enemy, and that's exactly where you want him. That's exactly where you want him. You want him as your enemy because you've defected from his kingdom, and you've entered into the kingdom of light. You've entered into the kingdom of God. He is still at work. He's still whispering but he is a toothless foe. He is defeated. You will have trouble in this world, Jesus said, but take heart, for I have overcome this world. So, the premise is that the devil is real, that he's active, and that he should be our enemy rather than our Lord. Secondly, we have the pretenders. As we move a little narrower from the premise into the pretenders, these are the ones that Jesus is speaking to. Verse 37, he says, I know that you're Abraham's descendants. They were physical descendants of Abraham. They were Jewish people. 
However, they were kidding themselves. They were pretenders because what they were doing was hiding behind their physical ancestry and trusting that for their spiritual standing before God. How many of us have done the same? How many of us are doing the same? Well, you know, my forefathers, my auntie, my granny, my great grand they were godly people, faithful people. Great. Fantastic. What a, what a legacy of blessing. What, what a blessing to know. But it doesn't really mean anything for you. And you're standing before God. We assume that perhaps because our forefathers were saved, then we will be. Because of our heritage, then, well, we'll be okay when it comes to judgment. Well, not according to Scripture. Some say, well, you know, I couldn't possibly profess my faith, and I couldn't possibly sit at the Lord's table because my godly great-aunt didn't do it. A complete misappropriation and misunderstanding of the gospel. Jesus first acknowledges here to these people, He says, I know that you're Abraham's descendants. And they say, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But as it happens, you're trying to kill me. You have murder in your hearts. Now, if you're going to have somebody in your family tree spiritual, then Abraham's a good place to start, isn't it? Abraham's a good one to have in your family tree because he was a man of faith. It says that throughout Scripture. Genesis 15, Abraham believed God and God credited it to him as righteousness. The New Testament holds Abraham up as a great example of faith. An entire chapter by Paul, Romans 4, is devoted to Abraham, the example of faith. Hebrews chapter 12, all the people who believed, the, the people of faith. Abraham is first in line. By faith, he obeyed God. So, you've got Abraham believing God. You've got Abraham obeying God. There's something else that Abraham did. He received heavenly messengers. Genesis 18, these three people that came as visitors to to Abraham. He went out of his way to get his wife Sarah to whip up something special for them, a nice meal, treated them uh, really well. They were God's messengers. He understood that. So, Abraham believed and it was credited as righteousness. Abraham obeyed God. He was a man of faith. Abraham received heavenly messengers. And then there's these descendants then of Abraham, and they're saying, well, we're Abraham's children. And Jesus is saying, well, you may be Abraham's children physically, but you're sure not Abraham's children spiritually, because Abraham wasn't trying to kill anyone. You're trying to kill me. Abraham received heavenly messengers. You're rejecting me. Abraham believed God. You don't believe anything that I'm saying to you. I'm God's messenger. I have come from the very presence of God. I am God in the flesh made manifest before you. So here's these religious people relying on their heritage, their physical descent for their spiritual well-being, relying upon their heritage for heaven. But the truth, of course, is you can be like somebody physically, but be miles away from them spiritually. Classic example, King Manasseh. King Manasseh was the wickedest king in Judah, more wicked than everyone who had ever come before him, more wicked even than the pagan kings that surrounded him. His dad, King Hezekiah, one of the best kings that Judah had ever had. His father, wonderful, righteous man, the son, a wicked dude, related genetically miles apart, spiritually and otherwise. So, here's a group of people cl claiming to be Abraham's children, and they were descendants of Abraham physically, but they were nothing like him spiritually. And they go from their physical birthright to their spiritual boast in verse 41. Jesus says, you do the deeds of your father. They have no idea what he's meaning. They don't pick up on what he's meaning. They say to him, huh, we're not illegitimate children. So, you hear the sarcasm that's in their voice. They're trying to embarrass Jesus. They're trying to bring him down because, well, we know that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he was born of Mary, that she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. But that didn't stop the rumor mill, did it? Jesus was illegitimate. He was uh, born of a mother who had been sleeping around before she got married. In the culture of the day, <gasps> shock, horror. 
But if you want to insult somebody, even yet today, what's a really good way to insult somebody? Start talking badly about their mother. It still stands. So they're bringing this up and they're pointing at Jesus. We're not illegitimate like you are, Jesus. It was an insult, wasn't it? Look at the second part of their statement. The only father we have is God himself, as they puff out their chests, both uh, ridiculing Christ and building themselves up in their faith. Now, both the first claim and the second claim were tied together. Because we are descendants of Abraham physically, therefore we are going to be God's children in heaven. That's really what they believed. Indeed, the rabbis, the teachers, told them that. One of the sayings of the rabbis was that Abraham was sitting next to the gates of hell, forbidding any Israelite to enter. Even the most wicked Israelite, according to the rabbis, couldn't enter because they were a child of Abraham, a descendant of Abraham. This is their security blanket. There's no truth in it whatsoever, but it's what they believed is because that's what they wanted to believe. So they automatically believe that if you're Jewish, you'll occupy a place in heaven. Why? Because there's a little scripture in Exodus where God himself, speaking of the nation Israel, says, Israel is my firstborn. Oh, well, they say, that must mean that every single Jew would be born, children of Abraham, and would occupy a place in heaven. But as we go through Scripture, we find that not to be the case, don't we? Paul says in Romans 9, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary. So, if we have Christian parents, if we have Christian grandparents, if we have Christian heritage, that is great, and it is a blessing, and it is a wonderful thing, but we will not automatically go to heaven because we have a Christian heritage. We have to think again. It doesn't matter who our parents or our grandparents were, but who are we? Who are you? The saying goes, God has no grandchildren, only children. Every generation, every individual has to reckon who they are in the sight of God, in Christ Jesus. So, from the premise, the evil one is real, and everybody has a relationship to him, to the pretenders, the, the spiritual posers, who've got this veneer, as we've called it before, of spiritual and religious respectability, but it's about half an inch thick. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just a mask. It's disguising. They're masquerading. They don't truly know. They're relying on the wrong thing. They have completely the wrong idea. So, we have the premise. We have the pretenders. Thirdly, finally, we have the paternity test. Now, Jesus gives this paternity test, and it's still applicable for us today, and it's very helpful for us as well as for them back then to know who our spiritual father is. And there are four questions that we have to answer, that you have to answer for yourself in your own heart and in your own life as to who your spiritual father is. Here's the paternity test. Number one, who do you love? Who do you love? Jesus says in verse 42, if God were your father, you would love me. Did they pass this test? No. They hated him. They hated Jesus. They wanted to kill him. They wanted rid of him. One of the telltale signs that a person is truly a Christian believer is that they love Jesus. I know that sounds so simple, it's ridiculous, but really, is that evident? Is that evident in your life? Is that evident to your colleagues? Is that evident in your home? Is it evident in your interpersonal relationships that you love Jesus? Would people be able to tell? Would people know? Truly loving Jesus is because we are understanding who we are, understanding our brokenness and His wonder and His mercy and His grace. Because we love God, we love the Son. Any parent gets that. Anyone who has shown favor to our children, we automatically kind of like them, don't we? They win a special place in our hearts. If you were God's children, you would love me. You'd honor God. You'd, you'd love me, he says. But they're not loving. They're hating him. One thing that you notice about somebody who comes to faith 
is this intense love for Jesus, this acknowledgement, this um, receiving, this acceptance of, this acknowledgement of the wonder of the gospel, that they are undeserving of His grace and His mercy, and yet it is theirs in Him truly and freely and, and fully. I wonder if love for Jesus is an identifying characteristic in your life as a Christian, an evident love for Jesus, manifestly obvious in what you do and how you speak and how you react. You know, if, if I or if, well, let's say if Jesus, no, I'm not putting myself on the same level as Jesus, but let's remove me and put Jesus in. Let's say Jesus came to your workplace for work experience. Would he see that you are a witness for him in your workplace, that your colleagues understand your love for Jesus because of how you interact and how you work and your ethic and your, uh, you, your, your speech? What if he came into your home? What if he came in uh, going out for dinner with you and your friends? Would your love for him be evident? That's how we can tell if somebody's connected, spiritually connected to the Lord by the love that they have for Jesus. Peter writes, even though you have never seen him, you love him, and you rejoice with joy and, and, and joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know why Peter wrote that? Peter wrote that because he was asked that very question by Jesus after his resurrection, wasn't he? That same question three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, here's the issue. Do you love me? Do you love Jesus? Do you love to talk about Jesus? Do you love to tell others about Jesus? Do you love to spend time with Jesus? Are you answering these questions honestly for yourself? If the answer is no, 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 then is Jesus truly your heavenly Father? Or are you still under the lordship of Satan? The first part of the paternity test is who do you love? The second part is what do you understand? What do you understand? Verse 43, what is my, why is my language not clear to you? Jesus says, because you are unable to hear what I say. Here's one way that I know that you're not God's child, that you are a child of the devil, is because I'm speaking God's language and you don't understand it. Children always understand the language of their father. Jesus is saying, I'm speaking the language of my father, and you don't accept it, you don't understand it, you don't receive it. It's like I'm speaking a foreign language because you're not of my father. That's what Paul writes, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians 2, 14, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of sharing your faith with somebody, or sharing a truth of the gospel, or talking about Jesus, and you're just aware that the person is looking at you like you've got two heads. You know, it's evident they just do not get what you're talking about. They don't get it at all. It's like trying to describe the colors in a beautiful sunset to somebody who's blind. They lack the capacity to truly appreciate it. Why is that? Because Paul reminds us, 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this age, the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Satan, the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They don't understand the message. Maybe you're sitting here today thinking, I don't get this. This is going right over the top of my head. Pray that the Lord would give you insight. We pray that the Spirit would come and anoint you and would come and pursue you and convict you. We need that. We cannot come to know the Lord without the, the work of the Lord Himself. So, who do you love? What do you understand? Thirdly, what are you doing? What are you doing? You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires, Jesus says. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language. 
for he is a liar and the father of lies. If God is your father, then you'll do what he does. If God is your father, your actions will prove the relationship. That's the point that Jesus is making here. He says that again in a few chapters, John chapter 14, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him. We've all had people that say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, yeah, yeah. I'm a Christian, love, love Jesus, I'm all about God, I'm all about the Bible, and you look at their life and you say, really? That's not being judgmental, that's just being observant. Because if somebody does everything that is at odds with Scripture, with Jesus, with His instruction, with His commands, saying, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, living in a way that is completely at odds with that, you say, really? Mm, not sure about that. Jesus says, I'll tell you who really loves me. It's the one who has my commands and fulfills them. The one who loves like I love. That's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Away from me, for I never knew you. It's an easy point, isn't it? Obedience proves the relationship. Obedience proves the relationship. Obedience doesn't produce the relationship. We've got to be careful about that. It's not about what we do, but it's about what we do as a result of. It's not about what we can do, but about what He has done. Obedience proves the relationship. It doesn't produce the relationship. Once we are saved, once we acknowledge the wonder-working power of Christ within our hearts and lives, then we will be motivated. We will have a drive and a desire to show our thanksgiving and our gratitude to God by following the commands that He has given to us. This is not rocket science. This is really straightforward stuff, but it doesn't make it any less challenging. You want to be an effective witness in Alipool? Follow the Father. Obey His commands. Love Jesus. Who do you love? What do you understand? What are you doing? Fourthly, finally, when do you listen? When do you listen? It's a good question, isn't it? Think about it just for a moment. When do you listen? Do you listen only when it's when you want, when it's what you want to hear? Or do you listen even when perhaps it's not really necessarily what you want to hear, but maybe what you need to hear? We like messages that are feel good, that tell us about ourselves and build us up and puff up maybe our ego and, and maybe tell us things that we really like to hear. We love to hear that. But then when it's hard truth, when it's truth is prickly like this, it's maybe not quite, we're not quite as receptive to it. Yet because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me, said Jesus to these people. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I'm telling the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. A telltale sign that somebody does not belong to the Lord is that they refuse to hear, that they refuse to listen. It's not just the inability, but it's the rebellion. I don't hear it. I don't like it. I don't want it. That's what happens when we harden our hearts. And this wasn't new to Jesus. This nation had a history of that. Think of the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. What was their biggest problem as prophets? Many people that they preached to turned away, walked away from what they heard because it was getting a bit too close to home, a wee bit too close to the bone. That's why Christianity is rejected in the modern world, as I wrote in the article in the Alipool News this week. Not because it's difficult, but because it gives us the answers that we don't want to hear. It gives us a simple solution. Jesus is our substitute. He takes our sin. He stands in our place. But then He wants us to live for Him and to Him. He wants us to follow His commands. He wants us to do what is right in His eyes. But so often the rebellious heart remains. What is the answer to the brokenness of the humanity that surrounds us? It's Jesus. It's the simplicity of His gospel. 
not what we can do, but what he has done. And yet, people turn away from that, like the rich young ruler who turned away and left sad because his God was his money. What is your God? Isaiah 30, for these are rebellious people, deceitful children, children unwilling to listen to the Lord's instruction. They tell the prophets, shut up, shut up. We, don't want to, we don't want to hear this. Tell us nice things. Flatter us. Soothe us. Soothe our ears and our rebellious hearts. It's the Fleetwood Mac song, isn't it? Tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. But Jesus isn't about lies or sweet little lies. He's all about the truth. Jesus could have walked up to them and said, you guys are okay. You know, you're trying hard. You're religious. You're, you're fastidious in your observation of religious and ceremonial right. And they would have loved him for it, wouldn't they? They would have said, yeah, give us more. Oh, you can do miracles. Yeah, we can partner with this guy. But that's not the truth, is it? They want to kill him. Why do they want to kill him? Because he tells them the truth. The same may be true when you go and share the gospel with somebody. They might want to kill you. They might have hatred in their heart, in their eyes, on their tongue, but it doesn't make the truth any less the truth. And so we're to be bold as the Lord's people. These people didn't want the truth. They didn't want the preacher. They wanted court jesters. They wanted entertainment. They wanted sermons that wouldn't disturb their thought or what they had determined was right in their minds. They were like Christmas trees, weren't they? decorated on the outside but dead on the inside like a bunch of cattle oil on the rear arch of a 90s Vauxhall Cavalier looking great but hiding all the rot that there is in behind it so here's the question as we conclude today what's the verdict on your paternity test your spiritual paternity test are you loving Jesus do you listen to him you share him? Are you following him? You say, yes. I say, hallelujah. Praise the Lord, as Martin uh, led us uh, a couple of weeks ago. Press on. Go on with him. Share the truth, even when it meets with hostility, resistance, even hatred. Share the truth, because the truth remains to be true. Show your true paternity. Show your true spiritual father by the characteristics you embody as you live for him. What about if your paternity test has come back negative? You're not the Lord's child. You're His creation, but you're still following the prince of the power of the air. You're still following the God of this world, small g. You're not loving Jesus. You're not understanding Jesus. You're not doing anything for Jesus. You're not listening to Jesus. What's the advice? Don't harden your heart any longer. But respond in faith. What is the acronym for faith? Forsaking all, I trust Him. Now is the time. Jump ship. Defect. Leave the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of light because Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. But only those who admit they're lost can be found. What's the result of your paternity test? spiritually this morning. Let's pray. God our Father, we give thanks for the great invitation that there is in and through Jesus to come and to know rest and rest for our souls, for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Lord, forgive us for the way in which we have rejected your invitation so often. Forgive us for the way in which we have claimed faith in you, but have failed to live by that. Lord, give us integrity of faith and of witness. May we be bold in our proclamation of Christ and our adherence and trust in him. And may you use that witness as a means by which you may draw others who are still confounded and who are still confused by the gospel, those who cannot see and do not understand. Lord, would you send your Spirit upon us even yet today to save those who are in the kingdom of darkness by bringing them into the glorious kingdom of light. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.